Amen. We want to say greetings to everyone and thank you all for joining us today. And my name is uh start recording that other one. My name is Brother Hawk Bolden and I have on side of me my wife, Sister Antoinette Bolden, and as always we're glad to bring you um the word of the Lord today. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, that's going to be a little different than what we are uh, normally doing concerning our um, broadcast and this particular service. As you know, we have uh, stopped the Thursday night broadcast, and so we're kind of doing once a week now uh, services. And so there will be times when we do God's blueprint for family, and there will be other times that we do God's truth and deliverance, but. It's really all the same, you know, when you think about it, because uh, everything that is preached can go towards family and can be applied to family. But uh, so this one is going to be kind of a mixture of both, you know, where uh, there are some things that we're going to address today uh, that have come to our attention. You know, of course, we have uh, people who uh, call us for us to minister to them and um so we do most of our ministering one-on-one -on -one with people uh, for their particular situation or circumstance. Uh, we don't, you know, so we try to just make ourselves available to help people where they are. And uh, so last night we had the opportunity to minister to um, a, a young lady who is married, you see, and uh, um, who's has a daughter that has autism and uh, from what we were told it was pretty severe and so we ministered to her for a couple of hours last night and so we're going to uh, get into some things uh, and I asked her permission if we could share this uh, with the congregation and with others who will uh, listen or watch this message at a later date and she said that it was okay and so uh, we've been talking about for the last several weeks divine healing and we're going to get uh, look at it from the opposite side today we we know that there is a such thing as divine healing and we know that it is God's will for people to walk in divine healing you see uh, it, it, uh, un that you know of course unfortunately uh, many people don't but it does not mean that it's not God's will you see, for whatever reason, there are different circumstances and things like that that goes into that. And you have to consider all of those things when you're talking about sickness. And so, uh, one of the reasons we said that God uses divine healing to heal people, use his power to heal people, is to confirm his word. There, and it, just like, you know, and we've stated before in times past that when something comes on you, whether it's sickness or whatever... Uh, God might not put it on you, but when he heal you, uh, part of the purpose of him healing you is not just to relieve you of the sickness or disease or whatever it may be that's ailing you, but is also to help others to show them that he's still a powerful God and more powerful than, than any sickness or disease or any other name, you see. And so... There's a reason that God sometimes allows things. Now, we say use that word allow because God is not responsible for every sickness that we encounter. Yeah. You see that God will chastise us. But then there are times when um, we may not need chastisement, but it comes on us anyway. You see that. And so then what? Well, God allows those things again for the purpose of of. Uh, so that he could heal us, so that not only we will recognize his power and authority, but others who know about the situation, who may be close to the situation, will recognize that it is God, you know, that it is his power and by his might that we are delivered. And so we have to be uh, mindful of all of those things. Now, on the other end of that, when God is, allows things, he, his will is sovereign. And it's bigger than what we may understand. Mm -hmm. And so oftentimes, when something happens, 
if we'll question God as if he's responsible, not understanding, understanding his sovereign will. And you have to think about it this way. All we are as human beings, and many of us we've seen little mice in the maze, or whatever it is that they put in those mazes. And, and, and those little animals, they're running through that maze, and they, they, they try to get to the other side of it where they can get out. And so they try different things. And the problem now, the problem with the, the, the animal that's in that maze is, is its foresight is limited. It can only see so far and then it gets up to that point and it sees, okay, this is a dead end, so let me turn around and go the other way. Because its vision is limited. But see... God's vision is not limited. And he's just like us as far as when we're looking at the little animal going through the maze, we can see what path it needs to take to get out of the maze. In other words, we can see the whole picture. But in comparison, when you compare us to God, we're like that animal that's in the maze where we can't see the whole picture. And that's where faith comes in that. Now, God sees the big picture. You see? He sees what it's going to take to get us out on the other side of it. And if we're not careful, we'll get frustrated with God because we'll think he's the reason why we're in the maze to begin with and which takes away our trust in him because we'll wonder, well, how can God love me and still allow this to happen? You see that? But there's a reason why. You see, there's a reason why God allows God's ultimate expression of love is not just him sending his son on to die for us on the cross, but also free will. If we didn't have free will, we'd be saying, well, how can God love me and not make me let me make my own decisions? <laughs> see, so. <laughs> Amen. And it also um, kind of goes in line with something we talked about maybe about a month ago concerning the sovereignty of God and how um, when you look at the whole picture or as he's looking at the whole picture, um, he sees the lives that are going to be touched by um, people who are on the outside watching us endure certain things when he's strengthening us and bringing us through those things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, oftentimes we use the phrase that sometimes we are the only Bible that people will see mm -hmm. and they need to know that. You know, we're not giving up on that one um, thing that we believe in, that the word is true in our life. Mm -hmm. And if somebody's watching you go through something difficult and they're looking for hope and they're trying to look to the hope that you have and you give up in the midst of that, then where does it leave that person who needs the hope that you already have? Amen. And so the Lord can see that too, even though we may not see all the people who on the outside are looking at our lives, you know, and looking to see us make it so that they can say, okay, well, I see that this really does work. I see that the path they're on is the path I want to be on. Mm -hmm. You know, and if we turn around midway, then it affects more than just us. Amen. So for, for anyone that's going through anything that you may not have answers to, you may have questions, but you may not have answers to them. You have to continue to move and push forward in the Lord. Because when you get on the other side of it, you'll understand it better. You see that? Mm -hmm. Now, this is a faith walk. And one of the hardest things for people to grasp after their salvation is walking by faith. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we're used to not walking by faith. Mm -hmm. We're trained not to walk by faith that's right. in this world. That's the reason why our minds have to be renewed to think of God as that one who, who is in control. Who is sovereign and all knowing. And when people have a problem walking by faith. What it really is. Is they have a problem with trusting God. Right. But you know what? Faith is something that has to be built. Just like trust mm -hmm. is something that has to be built. And it's not built. If we don't ever go through anything. Right. If God is always bailing you out. Before you get into anything. You where's your well, how's your faith being built? You just think it's always supposed to be this nice. 
And, and unfortunately, a lot of the so-called gospel that's being preached today from many pulpits <laughs> support that sentiment. It's just always supposed to be good. I'm not supposed to go through anything. I rebuke the spirit of suffering. <laughs> when Jesus said, in this world, you will have tribulations. But he said, be of Amen. good cheer, for I have overcome the world. Now, he's telling us what we're going to have. Amen. And the devil, you know, when you, when you get saved, the devil will say, oh, I, I lost another one. So I, their hands off for the rest of, you know, eternity. <laughs> You don't get that until God does away with the devil in the end. You see that? But until then, we have a devil to contend with. So let's go look at him. Let's go to the, uh, the first chapter of the book of Job. It is believed, by the way, since we're turning to this book, and I'm, that Job was the first book written in the Bible. And we say written in the Bible. We know it's not the first book of the Bible, but it was the first book that was written in the Bible. Apparently, Job lived before Moses. Now, Moses wrote the first five books of the Word. You see, so if, you don't, if you're going to understand anything about the Bible, understand this first. That is, it is not written in chronological order. You see that. So if you understand that, you see, you, you have a better understanding of his word. It's not written in chronological order. All right, so now we're going to read about Job. Let's go ahead and start reading at verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now we want to establish this point from the very jump. The Bible says that this man, Job, what was he? Perfect. Perfect and upright. Now that goes against the lie that's being preached today. Ain't nobody perfect. There was only one that was ever perfect. <laughs> this Bible says that he was not only perfect, but he was upright. And one that feared God and eschewed evil. Now, that means that he hated evil. Now, for some people who have a problem with preachers like myself, and my wife, and others who God have sent to preach his word, to preach against sin, we're supposed to hate evil. Amen. Even if that evil is on the inside of you. That's right. And we can't give you a pass just because you've chose to continue living in sin and not speak about what you're doing. We're supposed to hate evil. That's part of fearing God. Mm -hmm. You can't fear God and love evil at the same time. Amen. If you are living in sin, you, ne you need to hate it. Because God won't deliver you from sin mm -hmm. until you learn to hate what it is that you're doing. That's right. Amen. So it's a, it's a lot that just goes into this first verse here. And God established it. From the first verse, that this man was perfect and upright. Now, why did he feel the need to put that in there? He didn't have to put in there because it was other people that were perfect in this Bible that God never mentioned was perfect. There's a reason why. Mm -hmm. yeah, everything that we read in this Bible is that there, there's a reason why it's in there. Every single word that's put in this Bible is there's a reason why it's in there. All right, let's, let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 2. And there were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was seven thousand sheep and three thousand camels and five hundred yoke of oxen and five hundred she asses and a very great household so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the east. And his sons went and feasted in their houses, every one his day, and sent and called for their three sisters to eat and to drink with them. And it was so, when the days of their feasting were gone about, that Job sent and sanctified them and rose up early in the morning and offered burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, It may be that my sons have sinned 
and cursed God in their hearts. Thus did Job continually. So we, we get a picture that this perfect man has a perfect life. He was rich. Not only in substance, but in family. Because at that time, it was a blessing to have a big family. <laughs> Folks weren't doing birth control like they do today. Where children are looked upon as being a burden. And not only that, his children got along, which is a miracle in itself. <laughs> Grown and still able to go visit with one another. <laughs> Everything is perfect. Job is perfect. Family perfect. Livestock all in order. I'm rich. What worries do I have? I'm serving God. Let's go ahead and keep reading now. Verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, the, in the Old Testament, the sons of God were angels. Because before, the only son of God before, of course, was Adam. A son of God was somebody that was created. You see, that was created by God, that didn't have a, a parent. As in mom and daddy coming together and making him. So the sons of God in the Old Testament were angels. And there are a few references in the Bible where even Satan was called a son of God. He was not. He was created being, in other words. Created by God. Fallen, but still created by God. Everybody see that? Amen. And so in this day, the day came where the sons of God came to present themselves to God. And look at what it says. And Satan came also among them. Now that should show you the nature of the devil. He's not afraid of God. Not afraid of God. Even though he tried to throw God out of heaven. And warred with the angels of God. And you think about how bold he must be. A, a man come in your house and try to rob you and unsuccessful and then come have coffee or try to have coffee with you the next day. He pretty bold. Now, if he can be that way with God, hmm. what, how, what do you think he think about you? You think he's going to back off of you because all of a sudden you got saved? <laughs> if he's bold enough to go in the presence of God, after an unsuccessful attempt to overthrow God, he, he's not thinking about you. He don't care how many scriptures you know. Mm -mm. Your salvation is not security to not ever being touched by the devil. Amen. So we have to make that clear. And that's the reason why the Lord went out of his way in the first verse. To mention that Job was perfect and upright and, and feared God and hated evil. Mm -hmm. You can have all of that, but you know what? Until eternity starts, you still have a devil to contend with. That's right. And that's what you better know. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and read verse 7. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now notice the Lord didn't say, Devil, what you doing here? You still want some of this? Now let me make this clear. This may be hard for some religious folks to swallow. <laughs> God, now when we fall out with people, we ain't got to talk to them anymore for the rest of our lives. So let me make this clear. God and the devil are on speaking terms. <laughs> Everybody understand that? All right. <laughs> so he asked the devil, what have you been doing? Now the devil, he, he, know, he got better sense than a lot of God because God already knows to begin with. And look at how bold he, he's, he is. He didn't say, well, I was in church, you know, listening to some messages because I'm thinking about rededicating myself to you. In other words, he wasn't trying to tell God what he thought God wanted to hear. Amen. He's bold with it. 
going to and fro in the earth. Just like what the word of God says, seeking whom he may devour. And there's no secret about it. Now, let me tell you something. Life would be a whole lot easier if we knew who our enemies were all the time. God and Satan, they have that understanding. Satan hates God and, and God doesn't care too much for the devil. They know where each other stand with one another. And it's not that they're trying to be friendly with one another to overcome what have happened in the past. They just both understand this is where I am and that's where you are. We will never be on the same page. Mm -hmm. Now, God, with the sovereignty that he has, he understands ultimately the devil is a tool. Many times we believe the devil is there just to trap people and cause people to go to hell. The only thing the devil does is expose what's already on the inside of you. That's right. That's Amen. all he can do. Amen. Amen. God understands that. So God's not wiping the devil out, you know, yesterday for our sake to keep anybody else from going to hell. Mm -hmm. If you go there, you don't need a devil to do it. That's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> You see, so God and the devil are on speaking terms. They're not like us. I can't stand you. I don't even want to see you. All right. <laughs> Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 8. No, read verse 7 again. Okay. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it, and the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Everybody see that? So the devil tells God what he was doing. I'm walking around the earth, basically seeking who I can get to, who I can tempt. And God didn't say, well, don't you dare touch any of mine. You know better. <laughs> now, if you don't want me, you know, he's not like we are as parents with our children. Because I'll kill you over my kids. I'll walk through hell in gasoline drawers. Well, <laughs> 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 oh, we will fight, folks. Teachers up in school now, scared to usurp authority because of these crazy parents. And God's not like that. God said, have you considered one of mine? <laughs> Why? Because no matter how many teachers you fight, that don't stop your child from being bad. When you get done whipping on that teacher, it's got a jail for your child to go to when it's all said and done. God understands that. You, you can't get one of his to begin with. And all he does, when the devil comes, the word tempt can be translated as test. Now, it's up to you whether you pass it. All the devil can do is give you the test. He's not responsible for you flunking it. That's right. So... This looks unfair to the natural mind. Have you considered my servant Job? And look at what God says. He says, a perfect and upright man. One that feareth God and escheweth, in other words, hateth evil. Notice he didn't say, because God, Job is perfect and upright, you can't touch him. And so... When the devil is breaking loose in our lives, although we may consider ourselves and whether or not we're walking upright before God, we also have to consider that the devil doesn't need a reason to attack us. Mm -hmm. To the devil, it doesn't matter how perfect and upright you are before God. That's not going to stop him from coming against you. 
So let's get rid of this idea that because I feel like I'm in right standing with God, because I feel like I'm doing everything I know how to do, I shouldn't be attacked by the devil. The Bible lets us know that Jesus Christ suffered in the flesh and we should arm ourselves likewise. Amen. Everybody see that? And so that if, if we would take on that mindset, that would stop us from getting offended at God when things don't go our way. In fact, let's have the mindset we should expect attacks from the devil when we're serving God. Amen. The devil's not much concerned with folks he already have. He want to try to discourage you. Amen. Okay, let's go ahead and keep reading. And I just want to say this um, in conjunction with what you, what you said. If we're expecting an attack which means we're expecting to go to war with the enemy. We don't wait until we're being attacked to start preparing for that. That means we have to be preparing all the time for when that time comes, which is why we need to continuously be in prayer and fasting and um, in worship and sitting before the Lord and hearing the word and you know allowing our faith to be built up in the word and not just waiting until that attack comes to try to scramble and you know remember the scriptures or remember what the word said or try to get prayed up and ask for prayer that's the mindset we should always have that we're always preparing to go to war in the spirit mm -hmm. amen all right let's go ahead and keep reading uh, verse 9 then Satan answered the Lord and said doth Job fear God for naught has not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now, and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power, only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Now do we think that this is an isolated incident? Do we think Job is the only one who God gave permission to Satan to attack? Oh, this isn't isolated. If it was, there would be no reason for it to be in the Bible. If this was the one and only time this had ever happened and ever would happen, what would be the reason for it to be in the Word of God? God allowed this book to be written for a reason. You see that? Look, look at what... Satan says, verse 9, Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Look at what he said in verse 11. But put, he, in verse 10 he tells God, as if God needed a reminder, how he has blessed Job. In other words, the only reason why, God, Job is serving you, is because you have blessed them. It's easy for a man to walk perfect and upright when nothing's going on. But look at what he says in verse 11. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Hmm. In other words, you'll find out why he's serving you. Now, this should let us know that when an attack comes, the devil just, just does not come to attack us just because he hates you. There is a reason for the attack. Ultimately, look at what Job says. He then says, put forth now thine hand and, and touch all he hath, and he will be broken poor. He says, he will curse you to your face. In other words, he will turn his back on you. Now, every attack, that is the end design of what the devil ha is shooting for. For you to turn your back on God. Every attack that's mounted. It's not just because the devil don't want you to have a car. <laughs> he he hate the fact that you had kids. He's not attacking your bank account just because he wants you to be broke. Right. It's it, it's his way of checking 
to see what's your real motive for serving God. Can you serve God when you don't have children? Can you serve him when you don't have money in the bank? Or are you, are you only serving him when everything is going right? Can you only sing praises to God? You see, is God only worthy of your praise when everything is going okay? Wherever your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. And if your treasure is in earthly things, all the devil got to do is attack your earthly things. Amen. You see that? And he understands that. So every attack is designed to get you to turn your back on God. So it's not necessarily him just wanting to attack to take things from you because he don't like you. He ultimately wants your soul. And that's what's on the line with every attack that comes. That's why we have to be just as formidable and stubborn without salvation as the devil is about attacking us. Amen. Just as stubborn. All right. Let's go ahead and keep reading. So now we see that the devil has permission. And God, the only thing God says is don't touch his body. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 13. And there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And there came a messenger unto Job and said, The oxen were, um, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. Yet they have slain the servants with the edge and the sword and I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking there came also another and said, the fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burnt up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out in three bands and three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away. Yeah, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Then Job arose, and rent his mantles, and shaved his head, and fell down upon the ground, and worshipped, and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Now, does everybody see that? <clears throat> all of these things happened. One right behind the other. Just about at the same time, you could say. And where most people would have lost their minds... We find out where Job really stood with God. He didn't charge God foolishly. And let me make this clear. All of this happened. Now we're reading in the first few verses of this chapter where God and Job have a conversation. I mean, where God and, and Satan have a conversation about what's going to take place. Notice Job wasn't included in on it. Job didn't get to vote. On what was going to take place and, and what part of his life the devil was going to get to come against him in. Mm -hmm. yeah. He had no warning. Now we read it and we think, you know, it just it, it can it can come across as if, you know, uh, to us, maybe all of this just happened and Job was just prepared. Mm -hmm. The only thing Job had was his relationship with God. That's right. He had no warning. And a lot of times, that's what makes us suicidal when, when, when things come up on us. Because we have no warning. Which it goes back to what my wife was saying earlier. That's why we have to always be prepared. If we will have a mindset of suffering, mm -hmm. it won't seem foreign to us when we have to suffer. Mm -hmm. Amen. And I'm a living witness that whatever God allows to come our way, we have the grace to that's go right. through it. Amen. 
I'm talking about when we're servants of God now. I'm talking about when we're serving the Lord. You see that? So all of these things come upon Job without warning to him. And look at what he did. He shaved his head. He tore off his clothes. And he fell down on the ground. He didn't have a pity party. He worshipped God. Look at what he says. And this should be our mindset. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. And naked shall I return thither. Do you know? Let me tell you something. A lot of times we look at older people. And we think, oh, that's, that's a blessing to be old. I, I hope I live to be that old. But you know what comes with being old? Losing people. Right. Losing things. When it's all said and done, we're going to all be torn away from one another if the Lord tarries. That's right. It doesn't matter how much you love your mother, love your sibling. When they die, when they die you're not going with them. Somebody's going to have to say goodbye to somebody. Mm-hmm. Amen. And so while we're looking at Job's life and seeing all of these things happening to him at once, you know what happens in our lives? It happens over time. It's not common for ten brothers and sisters to die at one time. So it could be the space of 50 years. But y'all going to say goodbye to one another. That's why we have to love people right now. And have to treat them right, right now. Amen. You see that? Because over time, exactly what happened to Job, that's what's going to happen to us. You're going to suffer. You're going to have to go to somebody's funeral. You're going to have to say goodbye to somebody until eternity starts. You see that? Job just got it all at one time. (laughs) And look at what he says. That was his bottom line mindset. Naked came I out of my mother's womb. In other words, I didn't come here with all this I have. And so when I leave here, I'm going to be by myself. So what? So with that being said, what, what can we say about Job's mindset? My, the, my main thing is making sure I have a relationship with God. All right. Let's go ahead and keep reading. It's chapter 2, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. Now, Job have passed the test. He's passed that first test. And, and, when the, and when Satan tempted Jesus Christ, the Bible says after, God, after the Lord had rebuked him, the Bible says that Satan left him for a season. Mm-hmm. That means he came back. And we may think, well, thank God I've gotten over the hump. Well, you know what? The devil's got a, a mountain for you to get over the next time. <laughs> you can't think because I've passed this test, I don't have to worry about it anymore. So let's 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 pause here for those that have joined us since we started. We were ministering to a lady last night who got in touch with us, uh, who has a daughter that has um, autism and is very, very extreme. And she and her husband. And so she was telling us that uh, she and her husband did things right. They got married before they have cho- had children. Both of them were living, uh, uh, you know, at the same time were living for the Lord and, and things like that. So they checked to make sure that there was nothing on their end that they had done wrong. Because this daughter, I think at two and a half years old, was diagnosed with autism. Now, this goes back to what we said in, in, in the beginning of this message, that Job was a perfect and upright man. But that perfection and that upright and that righteousness with God did not stop the devil from trying to get to him. Right. So you can be doing everything perfectly, crossing all your T's and dotting all your I's. The devil's standing there to, to try to come against you. Ultimately, he wants your relationship with God. Right. You see that? And so, uh, that was one of the things that we explained to this young lady. Now, it had become so severe 
with this the daughter, this autism, where she was acting out. She was uh, what the mother called very aggressive. Kicking the other children, even the little two-year-old baby. And it had got to the point where they would have to, whenever, just riding in a vehicle would be a task. They would have to strap her down in a vehicle to go anywhere. Now, is it that the devil just hate this girl? Is that the only reason for this attack? Is it that because he just hate the family and he just don't have anything better to do than to just uh, strike uh, someone with autism? No. Ultimately, he wants souls. So let me explain the method that he's used with this family so that you can understand what ultimately he wants to do against you when he comes against you. Since the child had become so extreme in her behavior, the parents had to take turns going to church. They couldn't bring the child to church or they wouldn't bring the child to church because of the child's behavior. And so one Sunday the mother would go to church and the daddy would stay home and watch the daughter. And then the next Sunday the daddy would go and then the mother would stay home and watch the daughter. Can you see how now the devil is operating and attacking his family? Now, I've split up the marriage to where they're not going to church together. Because of this little girl's behavior. And so, it, it becoming the extreme of what it was the husband began to question, how can a loving God allow us to go through what we're going through? And as you've heard both my wife and I say, the same way that loving God could allow his own son to die on the cross for something he didn't do. Every sin that man would commit was on that cross. The Lord didn't, never, had never killed anybody. He didn't, he never blasphemed. He never stole anything. But he was killed for it. Mm -hmm. Everybody understand? And so it's not a matter of how can a loving God allow this to happen. It's a matter of you got an enemy that you have to contend with. Amen. And ultimately that enemy want to Want your soul. So, to make a long story short, what took place was the, the daddy who began to question the Lord. And now, let me make this clear. When you begin to question God and His sovereign will, the door is open for you to walk and turn your back on God. And, and that's what happened with the father. He, he turned his back on God. Uh, and I'm going to tell you, part of the reason is wrong theology. Mm -hmm. And let me explain what I mean. If we preach as ministers, God is in control of everything. But you know what? God is not the God of this world. The Bible says Satan is. Now him being Satan, if, if Satan is the God of this world, that means he has control over it. He rules it. So we can't blame God for allowing something to happen just because it has happened. See that? Because we're not doing that when we out in the world doing what we want to do. Mm -hmm. So what happened was uh, the father ended up not serving the Lord. They're still married, but for the last few years he hasn't been serving the Lord. That's the reason for the attack is to break the family down and to cause people to turn their backs on God. Amen. That's the reason for it. Amen. And see, so now this mother, the, the father is in, is in the military. And he's not, 
in the same location where the mother is right now. He's stationed somewhere else for a short, short time, you see. So now the mother is having to bear the burden of, of dealing. Now they have four children all together. And I think she said three of them have autism, if I'm not mistaken. But this one, the, the oldest one, the, the, the daughter, she has it the worst. And, you know, so this is the burden that she's under. Not only dealing with this child, but now having this attack against her marriage. So you have to know that everything that the devil does, there's an M.O. behind it. There's a method to what he's doing, and there's a reason why he's doing it. Right. It's to get you to turn your back on God. Why? If he got a lot of preachers in the pulpit preaching against you suffering and that idea of suffering, you won't ever see it coming. You won't ever expect to go through anything. Mm -hmm. Let me make this clear. You don't know problems until you start serving the Lord with your whole heart. Amen. Because up until that point, you're not an enemy of the devil. You're his friend. He already got those unbelievers and make-believers. Mm -hmm. He don't care about you going to church. You just be a hypocrite while you're doing it. Amen. You see that? And so, while we're mentioning this family and, and those that are listening in and those that are watching us, we want to ask you uh, to pray for this family. And I'm telling you, you know, as she was telling us her story last night, my wife and I, our hearts just went out to her. And not only to her, but think about all of the other people who may are going through things. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you, everything, anything that we can go through, there's an answer for it in the word of God. Amen. It may not be what we want to hear, but there is an answer for it. I didn't say there was a reason for it. I said there was an answer. <laughs> <laughs> You see that? In other words, there, there's a way that God has designed in His Word that we can deal with whatever the devil brings to us. Amen. And she was saying that she would talk to certain people, even ministers, and, 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 and they would come up with you know, different ways and different, different reasons why and, and, and things like that. And basically, just trying to get her to accept Right. This is your way of life. And maybe you just have to deal with it. But you know what? When the devil trespasses, we should know that he's trespassing. Amen. If you're sitting in your living room in a house that you bought on a, on a sofa, a chair that you bought, you don't, you don't expect some stranger to come sitting there with you, eating up your food. Not, you know, with, with, in other words, when someone comes to your house mm -hmm. and sitting in your, on your, at your table... It's because you have some kind of relationship with them. If you don't know them, especially if they're your enemy, you don't expect them to come sit down with you. You consider that trespassing. And you would get disgusted at the fact that someone would have the nerves. That's right. And that's what God intends for us to have. Is a disgust yeah. at what the devil brings. Mm -hmm. No, we can't stop him from bringing it. But you know what? We don't have to accept it. We don't have to accept this is going to be the norm. Amen. We see that Job lost ten children. And you know what? God blessed him with, with more. With, before this story was, was all said and done. He didn't say, well, you know, the devil's still in my life attacking me, so I'm, not, I'm just not going to have children. The devil is attacking me in my finances and in my possessions, so I'm just not going to acquire anything else. <laughs> in other words, that attack did not become his reality and his norm. Amen. He understood what it was. It's an attack. Amen. What, what, what year was it? World War II started in 1941. Isn't that still going on?
when the Lord, when when Satan tempted the Lord, and and the Lord rebuked him after so many tries, the Bible says that he left him for a season. That means that it wasn't constant. Unless, as believers, we should not, should not accept what the devil is doing to be the norm. Amen. You see that? And, and it, when we have that kind of mind, then we should stand on what God's word. God's word is what's normal. Amen. And, and the way this young lady, she said she found us, this ministry. Somebody, I don't know who it was, had asked the question. Uh, and you know how we do the question and answer sessions where people email questions or if they're sitting here locally, they'll ask a question. And somebody asked me, what is autism? And I was just simple and plain with it. it it's a spirit. It's not normal for any child to have autism. And you know it by the fruit. Mm -hmm. Why? Because you can be sick. And not yell out and cause, you know, uh, big shows, I guess. You can be sick and not cut yourself, not do harm to yourself and do harm to others. Mm -hmm. So you know that spirit, you know it's a spirit by the fruit of what it's bearing. Mm -hmm. And she was saying how hard it was for her to hear that. And, and so we had to make it clear to her last night, there's not one thing that a doctor can do for it. Well, they may give you medicine to make them calm down, a drug to make them calm down. That don't make that spirit go anywhere. And when you read about all the side effects of it when, it, when it's all said and done, you just come out better not taking it to begin with. You see that? Amen. The only cure for it is the power of God. Amen. And we won't see the power of God if we have accepted the power of the devil. Mm -hmm. So that's the first thing we have to do is establish this is a normal. Devil, this is you. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. You know something else that she said in that she said when she heard the answer to what it was, it was difficult for her to hear and especially difficult for her to hear that about her child. But she said, but in my spirit, I knew it was truth. Mm -hmm. And she was willing to accept that. And that's just something to bring out that, you know, the word might be difficult for our flesh sometimes. But we need to be in a position to accept truth regardless to how our flesh may feel about it. Amen. Amen. All right. So let's, let's continue to read now. Chapter 2 of the book of Job, verse 1. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? And Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job? Stop there. So, we see that Satan was still up to his same tricks. And he's still doing that today. Mm -hmm. He doesn't take a break. The Lord asked him the same thing in chapter 1. And he responded with the same answer. And then the Lord asked him. Now, why did the Lord ask him that? Was it that God didn't know what he was doing? No. He wants us to know. And he wanted us to see it come out of the devil's own mouth. Does everybody understand? Because if God hadn't asked him that, what would be the reason for it even being in the word of God? Besides what we read in, in, in one of the epistles of Peter. He goes through the earth, seeking whom he, the Bible says, may devour. Now that, that means with your permission. But we see in chapter 1, he did not have permission with Job because Job was perfect and upright. But yet and still, God said, have you considered my servant Job? Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 3. And the Lord said unto Satan, Has thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? 
and still holdeth fast his integrity. See there? Let's go ahead and keep reading. Although thou movest me against him to destroy him without cause. Now everybody see that. That even after he after you caused all of these things to take place in his life, Satan, he's still walking with integrity. He's still perfect and upright. That means you can go through something and still come out better than what you were before you started going through it. We preached a message on this many years ago. God's gold is purified with fire. Now, if you want to get somewhere in God, that means you're going to have to go through some things. Amen. His gold is purified with fire, with trouble, with tribulation. All right, let's go and keep reading. Verse 4. And Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yeah, all that a man hath will he give for his life. But put forth thine hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse thee to thy face. So, Satan had taken all of Job's material possessions and his children. And look at what he says, but if you touch his flesh, now I couldn't get him to curse you by taking his things. But you touch his flesh, he'll, he'll turn his back on you then. Do you ever think about, how do you know you're saved? How do you know you're completely sold out to God unless the devil have come to try to purchase you? Hmm. You can't say you're sold out to one thing completely unless you have turned down everything else. That's right. And many of us, we want, to walk, we want to walk this easy Christian life without ever going through anything. How do you know you're even sold out? That's the purpose of the book of Job. It was to show there is a such thing as being sold out to God. And, and, and how those things are, are made to be that way, you see. How do you know you're sold out to God if the devil haven't come to try to purchase you or to buy you? All right. Let's go ahead and keep reading. Verse 6. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, he is in thine hand, but save his life. So went Satan forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. And he took him a potsherd to scrape himself withal, and he sat down among the ashes. Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. The woman who was supposed to care about Job the most got tired because, see, they weren't just Job's children. They just weren't his possessions that he lost. Though That, that stuff belonged to her as well. She gave birth to those children. And now to look and see her husband going through it. She said, do you still have integrity? Why don't you just curse God and die? Isn't that something for your spouse to tell you? Now let me tell you something. That devil know how to get to people. And if somebody come up to you and tell you they think you're a liar, you've never seen them before, you don't have a relationship with them, you wouldn't think much about it. But you let somebody that love you and that you love tell you those hurtful things. Then it's going to break your heart. And that's what the devil wants. He wants to get those people that are close to your heart. And my prayer is that, that we who call ourselves uh, uh, Christians, that we're not allowing the devil to use us to get to other people. Whether it's our spouse, whether it's other believers, whatever it is. We better not be the instrument that the devil is using. You see that? Amen. So his own wife tells him, just curse God and die. Now you know, you have to have a made up mind 
to serve the Lord when your own spouse can turn their back? Apparently, she had a price. You see, today there's this thing that they call mercy killing, where one spouse, in some cases, kill a spouse because they don't want that spouse to suffer or to go through anything. And I understand that it's hard to sit back and watch somebody suffer. But you know what? That's when we're going to pray even the harder. I'm not going to kill you or hope that you die to stop you from suffering. I'm just going to pray harder. (laughs) Why? Because after the person is gone, you're going to still suffer. Mm -hmm. They're going to be gone. You're not going to be able to get to them. And so the thing to do when the devil attacks, especially for spouses, is not to just part ways, uh, you know, and, and to turn against one another. That's when you really have to band together and stand against the, the enemy. Amen. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and keep reading. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? And all this did not Job sin with his lips. Now you notice he didn't say. Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil from God? He says, shall we, and shall we not receive evil? And look at what it says. In all this did not Job sin how? With his lips. With his lips. You know why? Because that mouth will make things a whole lot worse than what it already is. If we're not careful. You see that? And so, Job have given us a point to consider. We love God as long as we're receiving blessings and as long as everything is going right. But boy, you let the devil start cutting up, now all of a sudden we're questioning God. Well, you know what what happens then? You're just an ungrateful brat. Just like a child who you who you bought a bike for at a bike for at the age of 13, at 14 they want a car and, and just threw the bike away. No, you keep riding that bike and and show appreciation for it. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately, many mothers and fathers, many parents today don't want their children to go through anything. The child come home, you know, uh, complaining about this and that, and we're ready to go to war. God didn't go to bat for, for Job. That was building Job's righteousness. That was showing what was in Job to begin with. He had to be tested for God to say he was perfect and upright. Listen, if you can't say there's any evil in you, you see, and that you've overcome anything, if you didn't have a hurdle to step over. If there was no devil in this world to tempt you with evil, you wouldn't do evil. So how do you know you, whether you're righteous or not? Mm-hmm. There wouldn't be su- a such thing as night if there wasn't a such thing as day. It would just all be the same. That's the reason why the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was put in the middle of the garden. There, you can't say you have free will if you don't have a choice to make. And you can't say that you're righteous if you haven't learned to turn down unrighteousness. Mm-hmm. Amen. So in this case, when, we, when we're dealing with adversity, we have to know it's bigger than what it appears to be. That there's a plan behind it. This, this child, this little girl that has autism, the devil didn't stop there. He's after their marriage. And he's after their souls. Amen. And when the devil comes against you, it's not just to to take your house or your your, and and or and anything like that. It's ultimately designed to get you to turn your back on God. Now the question is, what are you going to do with that? Now that you know that that's the devil's plan, what are you going to do with it? Are you going to let him win? Or are you going to stand? At the end of this story, 
you see, you can keep reading. If you keep reading through this chapter, you see that Job's three friends come to visit him. And if I'm not mistaken, I think it says that they sat there for seven days in verse 13. So they sat with him upon the ground seven days and seven nights, and none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. Seven days and seven nights, they just sat there looking at him in their own disbelief. How in the world? And so for the next several chapters, they get into this dialogue of why it happened. Job, you had to do something because God is just too loving to allow this to happen. Hmm. And you know what Job should have did? Y'all get up and go home. And, and, and that's what we need to do. When folks come mm-hmm. with, with ungodly counsel, we need to open that door and send them out of it. Because I'm telling you, you continue to entertain foolishness. That's right. The Bible says that Job didn't sin with his lips. But you know what? At the end of this, God had to come to Job. Job, where were you when I created the heavens and earth? In other words, you got it all figured out. How did I do that? How did I create the heaven and the earth? How is the earth even sitting in the middle of nowhere? Why is it not falling? Let's not get ourselves in a place where we question God. The Bible don't tell us to question. It tells us to trust Him. Have faith in Him. What? That He loves us now. With trust comes love. You can't trust anybody that you don't love or that you don't believe love you. And so if you really believe that God loves you, then that's where the trust comes in at. And with trust comes faith. Okay, Lord, I trust you, so I have faith that this is going to work out. We have to be that way, you see. And God intends for us to stand on His Word. This book here, It's not just a bunch of good stories that that we can read to entertain ourselves. It's what we're supposed to live by. These people in the Bible, no matter how righteous they were, they went through some things. And this word is designed to help us so that when we go through some things, we'll know how to act accordingly. So let's not get disgruntled at God. You see that? Divine healing comes. It'll come. But we have to make sure we're standing in a place to receive it. Wouldn't it be a shame for God to have an appointed day for us to receive divine healing from Him? But when it gets to that day, we're nowhere to be found. We're not in sight. Mm -hmm. Just like somebody that's called for an interview. You got an interview at 7 o'clock or or 10 10 a.m. on Monday morning, but you're not there. How do you think you're going to get the job if you're not there? And nine times out of ten, you won't even get the job if you're two minutes late. Let's alone not dressed right. You can be on time and not dressed right. Mm-hmm. So let me submit this. When we, when we put our fork in God's word and we're expecting, we better be in a place to receive it. Amen. We have to be dressed for it. The Bible tells us to put on the whole arm of God. Not some of it. Lord, it's hot today, so I'm not going to wear this breastplate of righteousness. We have to have it all on, you see. We have to have it all on. Amen. Amen. So we just want to express for you all to continue to uh, pray for this family. Not only this family, but others like it. Because, you know, in listening to that, I thought about the many other people who are going through some of the same things. Not maybe, maybe not with autism, but with other things that the devil is attacking them with. That's the reason why we need one another. We have to continue to lift one another up in prayer. You see, because the devil is busy. He, he is busy. He don't ever take a break. The devil, he's a spirit, so he don't ever sleep. He don't need rest. You see, he doesn't need rest. And so, that's why the Bible tells us to pray without ceasing. Because the devil is working without ceasing. (laughs) 
And just as tenacious as the devil is about coming against us, we should be just as tenacious with standing our ground on God's word. Amen. Amen.